sometimes when we can't find solutions, I think it's not the answer that we're struggling with. It's maybe asking the wrong question. And one of the questions that is being asked over and over again right now is why are teachers leaving the profession? And it's a very valid and justified question because tons of teachers are leaving education right now. But a different question that you can ask is why are people staying? Why are they staying? And what is it that makes people want to stay in their school, in their district, in the profession? And in that answer, we actually might be able to better address why people are leaving. What are some of the things that we can actually change? And I don't know if I really thought about this before, but I did today when I was interviewing Jen Mott and her focus on her new book called Teacher Veerance and talking about why educators have chosen to stay in the profession, especially during one of the hardest times. What are the factors? What are the things that make such a difference with educators and why they choose to stay? And I don't know if this is going to make anyone listening to this um, stay. I don't know if the book's going to make anyone listen to stay, but I do appreciate asking a different question because too often when we talk about problems, we focus on, on the things that we shouldn't do, what we couldn't do, as opposed to what can we do to make things better. So I really enjoyed this conversation. I hope you do too. Check out the book, Teacher Veerance. It's in the description down below, but I'm going to turn it over to Jen. Great, great episode. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Hey everyone, this is George Kroos. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I am blessed today to have Jen Mott, who is an assistant principal and athletic director at Mason Middle School and Mason City. Is it Mason City Schools? Am I saying that right? I know it's Mason. You're yeah. right. Yes. Mason correct. City Schools. Yeah. I was there years ago. Give you a little shout out. So I remember, That's right. That's I remember right. <laughs> actually uh, being there and sharing. I actually share stories to this day from uh, a student I remember seeing at Mason um, speak the day I was there. So I, I, I very vividly remember uh, joining you all. But uh, not only Jen is she an assistant principal, uh, she also is a, a, she's not an entertainer. She's a professional entertainer. When you said that, I was like, wow, like I try to be entertaining, but I'm not professional. Like, so that's, that's a little different. <laughs> I mean, right. Yeah, you know, absolutely. You know, I love it. So, I think all educators are professional right. entertainers. It I guess, just, I guess you know, so. it's a different definition of it. Yes. Uh -huh. That's fair. That's fair. And then, and then yeah. last but not least, uh, she actually has a brand new book out. You can see it in the description down below. And I've been practicing saying this teacher appearance. I got that part down teacher appearance. That's right. Hope while embracing perseverance, why am I having, is this like a Canadian thing in education? You so, got it. You got it. Uh -huh. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the book and talk a little bit about kind of some of your experience. But before we get to that, if you can just tell us who you are, what you do today, how you got there, great place to start. Sure. I appreciate you having me. Thank you so much. And I am, so I'm in Mason, Ohio, but in the greater Cincinnati area. I I've worked in five different amazing districts and six different schools uh, over the years. And my entire experience is grades seven through 12. Um, so secondary uh, and teaching, but also doing school administration and also now in athletics world is all natural fit for me because I do teach at the college level outside of, um, you know, working full time at this middle school. I get to teach uh, teachers who want to become administrators or school leaders in some way. And I was a college student athlete who then went on to teach and coach at every single season that I taught. And so it's really amazing to now be able to be in school administration, teach future school administrators, mm -hmm. and also work through the athletics realm of leadership. It's been just such a fun meld of all of my uh, skills, interests, and um, experience. And so that's where I am now and uh, really grateful to be able to share also the work of just teacher perseverance and why mm. teachers stay. So that's kind of the journey of how I got there originally though. Well, you know, like that perseverance for me in, in the work that I do and the person I'm trying to become, like a lot of it is connected to athletics for me, you know, growing up. And so mm -hmm. uh, I know many of my coaches had huge amount of influence. Uh, my basketball coach, Kevin Greenman, who passed away, uh, several years ago, I think about this man all of the time and the lessons and how big the impact on me. Do you, do you see like, what are some of like the, you know, what's like one or two lessons that you have 
like in athletics that you take in your current role as an educator? Like what, what are some of the things that you, you bring over? Cause I, I, I'm a huge advocate of kids playing sports and I know whether it's, you know, um, like, you know, doing something solo, doing team sports, I think it just teaches so many skills. So like, what, what did you learn from that that you're bringing over to what you do in education? So one of the biggest things I would say is the challenge of the optimist. And so when you have such a challenging loss or frustrating season or anything like that, being able to still see the positive side is mm -hmm. like, that's not the end of the journey. That's not the end of the story or anything like that. So the connection to me is like in this work, um, I think there are a lot of teachers who are in a challenging season and who do feel burnt out or do, do feel down and out or defeated. Mm -hmm. And so the optimist in me says, well, everyone, I believe the national conversation right now is teachers are leaving, teachers are leaving, but mm -hmm. I've, I have the mindset of, but every year I'm going to retirement parties for teachers who have stayed for 30, 35, 37 years. And so why aren't we giving voice to them? And so that's to me, the optimist mindset of it is hard. I'm not ever going to say that it isn't hard, but in the midst of that hard or that challenge, what are those positives that we can hang on to that are the legacy work of teachers and are the things that is keeping them? And so that would be one of the biggest ones for me from sports is just, yes, there are challenges. Yes, there is defeat. Um, but man, if we just like wallow in that, that's not yeah. getting us anywhere. And so how can we look at the optimistic side of uh, glasses half full and what is the work we can do to realize that there's more to the story and more to the journey? Yeah, you know, so I, I don't know if you know this, but I just ran a marathon in January. And the, yes, the, congratulations. The, thank you. Yes. Well, and you know, if you run a marathon, the, the most important part is you get to tell everyone you ran a marathon. <laughs> that's, a, <laughs> that's right. That's like, yeah. You know, then you could say, I ran a marathon. So you could say that over and over again. Yeah. Um, but it was, you know, like it's very, <laughs> it is not just a physical thing, it's a very mental thing. And I remember reading uh, Ryan Hall and there is a piece of advice in his book and he's like one of the best marathon runners um, in US history. And there is one piece of advice that he utilized or he used and, and shared that I, I don't think, I, to be honest, I don't think I would have finished if it wasn't for this. And it said, basically when you are struggling, um, the worst thing you do is focus on the pain because it only gets worse. And what you should focus on is something that brings you joy and something you're looking forward to. And I actually, when I was started struggling and when I, like, not just in the marathon race, but like when you're doing your long runs, all that process, um, utilizing that information, I would think of like my one-year-old son Marino running to me at the door, his excitement, my kids being at the finish line at that race. And not only did it actually like help me kind of get my mind off the pain, uh, it actually, it gave me energy, which was, you know, it yeah. was, that was what really shifted for me was it wasn't just like to get a distraction. It actually brought that joy and, and, and lifted. And it, there's, there's something, I don't know how true this is because I've never done it. It said, um, think of someone you, if think of someone you don't like, and you put your arms out to the side. And if you think of someone like you're not really happy with, it's like super easy to push your arms down. But that this is what he said in the book. So maybe this is like, let's uh -huh. see if people test this. And then he said, okay, yes. think of someone you love and put your arms out. And it's actually way harder to push your arms down. And it was like, a, That's interesting. is that true? I don't know. Yeah, but it's the mindset I, change of, yeah. I don't want to test it because I'd be so disappointed <laughs> if it wasn't true. But I'm going to just kind of go with it. So that really, really helped. And he, I'm going to ask you this question. I'm curious your thoughts on this because I guarantee um, someone listening to this is going to at least know, if not think this himself, this sounds, this is like the whole new thing in education. I hear about all toxic positivity, right? Like when you say, like, wh how do you, like, how do you distinguish between what you're talking about? And here's, how, I always give this example of toxic positivity because I think it's a thing. But I think a lot of times it's just like a, we just, anyone who has a positive outlook or, you know, trying to find solutions, it's super easy to lay, label them as toxic, as having toxic positivity. And I always say this, toxic positivity is a thing. And here's an example. My house is burning down. I'm standing in the middle of it. I'm like, Ooh, it's nice and warm in here. That's toxic positivity. I get that, right? It's a great example. Right. Yeah. But if it is actually, you know, if my house is burning down, the first thing I'm saying is like, okay, my house is burning down. 
what do I need to do to put this fire out to like solve this problem right away? Mm -hmm. And it's not about ignoring problems. It's about finding solution. That to me is really important. So where do you kind of see that line and what you're talking about, what you're sharing and maybe where, and and maybe this is, and maybe I'm putting words into your mouth and maybe I'm just guiding a question here. I don't know, but like, no, it's good. I I don't, I don't want someone saying like, Hey, you know what? It's only good. That would be a lie too. Right. So like, where do you kind of find that line? Why do you, where do you find that line? Yeah. So for me personally, generally my natural bend is optimism and is positivity. Yeah. And so I was one of those people, George, when toxic positivity started becoming a thing where I was Uh-oh. like, oh shoot, now my positivity is bad. Like right, right. I, I just really was surprised by that. But I do think there is value in calling it out of like um, people not changing it because right. they're just saying, but it's all great. It's all great. And so we're not changing things because we're thinking that it's all okay. When in fact there are holes that could be poked and could be improved. Mm-hmm. And then connected to the work that I did with teacher perseverance is I, you know, interviewed over 40 teachers who were uh, 15 years or more into education consecutively. And I thought they were doing me a favor, right? Like I thought, um, I thought, thank you so much for taking the time during fall of 2020. We all know how that was going. And I just kept saying, thank you. And what was so surprising to me to answer the question was they were the ones thanking me. They were like, thank you for giving us a voice and thank right. you for letting us share our story. And I didn't expect that because one of the things that came out of it, so there's four themes that came out of their right. interviews and they are higher calling community, the only option and contextual joy. And those are fleshed out through their narratives, through their you know quotes, through their storytelling, all of that. But higher calling is one of them. And I think to the point of toxic positivity, higher calling can have that duality feeling of uh, it. Yes, it's great. I have a higher calling. I have a groundedness in whatever like spiritual or faith or anything of like why I'm doing this, just some sort of purpose. But people might say teaching is a higher calling. So therefore it's okay that we treat you this way, right? Like, because it's a higher calling. And so we can pay you this, or we can, you know, do these things. And that's not okay, right? There are still boundaries that need to happen where we can make systems better for people. And it can also be a higher calling. I just think it's not a but, like a, it's not a either or, it's just an and, right? It can be a higher calling and we can also treat you better and understand that education needs to be fixed and changed and updated and uh, helped in a lot of ways. Um, but it doesn't just exclude the higher calling from existing. And the fact that we can focus on the positives and the legacy work that teachers have, Mm -hmm. and the fact that we really do make a difference in all fields uh, because of the work that educators do. And so it's just the mindset change of not saying it's all good or all positive. I certainly shared some of the struggles of some of the teachers' journeys, including my own. It reads part narrative on my own story. but there is a focus on the positive bend because it is incredible. We get to impact people every single day. And I love that that is ultimately the work we are doing is being in the business of growing people. And that is to me more meaningful than anything else. Okay. So let's, let's see. I want to see what you say to this. I'm, I'm curious of your thoughts. So I saw, I don't know if you know, Eric Thomas. Um, I think he's, I think he's goes like by the hip hop preacher. I, this guy, one of the videos he has is one of my favorites ever. I actually listen to it once a week. It's, um, it's, it's like called how bad do you want it? I'll link it down in the description below. I, like it's, you know, it's not like a inspirational teaching video. It's like when I'm, I don't want to exercise. <laughs> it's one of those videos okay, like, okay. You know, kind of screaming at me, like, you know, whatever. Anyways, um, he's, I saw just something from him recently and he basically said, everything's my fault. Like I look at everything as my fault and you see that it's, it's, you know, I think it's meant to be a little bit of a jarring statement. And he says, the reason why I believe that is because if it's my fault, then I have, I don't give you power. I don't give you power to over me. And that means if it's my fault, then I can be the solution. And it was like a kind of an interesting take. And I, I, and maybe I'm bad, I'm bad for this. There's people that say like, oh, like I hate teaching. I hate this. I'm like, I'll quit your job. I quit it. If it don't stay, don't be miserable. Don't stay there too. And I know, and I like, can we make the profession better? 
Absolutely. But also you shouldn't be staying in a place that makes you miserable and you shouldn't mm -hmm. like, sometimes I know from experience that sometimes the best thing you can do as a teacher is go to a different school, find a different yes. job. And, and that's part of it right. too. And like, if you, if you don't like your principal or your superintendent, waiting them out, not the best strategy. Right. Cause they might stay longer than you. Cause, they, cause if you don't like them, they might not be that good at their job and they're not getting a bunch of offers elsewhere too. Do you know what I mean? So sure. I don't yeah. know. I don't know what you think. Cause I, you know, like I'm, I'm not like everything's your fault guy, but I'm also like, Hey, like I have to live with myself and I have to kind of figure out mm -hmm. cause I don't want to be miserable. I don't want to be miserable. And that's like, that's kind of advice. I try to like, Hey, if you're unhappy, then you got to figure out something because stay it. Cause you already know staying there ain't making you happy. So like, how, how do you look at yes. that? Cause I, I, you know, that I'm curious yeah. cause I don't think I don't necessarily like sometimes like, Hey, I hate teaching. Then you should leave teaching. I get it. But if I hate right. teaching at this <laughs> yes. school, if I hate teaching yeah. at this school, a change of scenery might be good. Right. So I, yeah. I don't know what you think of that. I'm, I'm curious to your thoughts. Sure. So, um, first of I saw, all, did I really sound horrible there? Did I sound horrible? No, no, I okay. totally hear you. And I'll, yeah. I'll work, I'll, I'll work with you on that. I totally understand <laughs> the sentiment and right. here's, here's what, here's what I'm thinking with that. Cause I, one thing is that currently in our district, we have been really fortunate to do a lot of culture work. Right. And so one of the, we have common language K-12 uh, mm -hmm. for culture that our educators not only use at school, but also at home with their own kids, which is really neat. Right. And so it also gives us language to share with families when they're working with their kids. And one of the things to, um, you know, what uh, he said about like nothing is, um, or everything's my fault is right. we use the language own the moment. And okay. so we say own the moment all of the time. And so it's, it's that exact point of like a student saying, well, they, will they, will they, and we just will change the language to own the moment. What did you do? What was your part in that? Right. Mm -hmm. And so owning that moment is something we all can embody, even as educators, even as adults in our own lives, um, owning the moment of, well, they, 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 sure. But also what did I do? What was my response? Mm -hmm. What was my, you know, what, what was my reaction or what, what did I do to get myself in that uh, position in the first place, right? Those are the parts of owning the moment. And then to speak to the leaving part, I totally <laughs> hear you. I actually wrote, I actually wrote right. in the book because I wanted to make sure it was said. I said, you only, you know, your own experience and right. you know, your own feelings and how you're doing like, healthy wise, right? Like mental health matters, right? And so like, you know how you're doing. And if teaching is no longer for you, then it is no longer for you. I'm not going to be the one to say in a book, you must stay, right? Like that's not right. good for anyone, for either side, for the students or for you as a staff member. But to the point of changing schools or anything, mm -hmm. one of the themes that is mentioned in the book, this is one of the larger chapters, is contextual joy. And the way I described contextual joy is finding joy in the right context. And the right context can be mm -hmm. grade level, it can be content for those who are dual certified, it can be school or a district change, right? Mm -hmm. And so don't, the saddest thing for me in this trend of teachers leaving is newer teachers who are new to the profession and they leave teaching after one to three to five years, but they haven't tried anywhere else. Right. And I'm like, no, we lost someone who could have been an amazing teacher, but they just didn't have the right support in that context, right? Or that context wasn't meant for them because sometimes people are just better equipped for middle school than high school or vice versa, or for primary rather than, you know, middle, like there's all these different um, scenarios or, you know, I am a, a teacher in a typical classroom, but then I go back to uh, learn more about special education. And now I'm an intervention specialist supporting students in smaller groups, right? Like what is the right context that most brings you joy? And it could be content, it could be grade, it could be a school, but don't make it just about the teaching or like you said, leadership, right? It could be leadership. This is not great leadership here, but over here, I would love to try to find a leader who is invested in me and who is helping me and supporting me. Um, I said in the I said in the book, I said, if you are someone who is complaining about your administration, I am just so sorry that you have the wrong administration. I mean, I said right. that because I'm just so sad that that's part of their story because I know really fantastic administrators who are really dedicated and caring people. And so I'm just so sorry for people who that is their story. And so I'm giving them permission to find a different story for themselves rather than just getting out of teaching.
So I think hopefully that speaks to a little bit of the mm -hmm. onus on the person of what are things you can do to find a different context for you that brings you the adequate amount of joy that you need to be able to stay. You know, so I, and I think one of the things too, that is really important. It's not, it's just not all the things of teaching. It's actually the things outside of teaching too, that might bring you misery. And perfect example is I actually was in a district that I had to live in a very small town and was nowhere near a city. And at the time I was like, I, there's like nothing to do here. It is, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm very, I, I, I'm single. I don't know anybody. I'm not interested in some of the things that, you know, were happening in the town kind of thing. So I kind of felt really isolated. So I knew I needed to move to a big city or a larger city at the time. And that did change a lot of things right. to me. Cause it's not just what happens in your school. It's like, you know, social life aspects outside. And I remember, um, one of the toughest things I had to do, I really, when I was assistant principal, I really was excited to actually become a principal. And I don't think I've ever shared this. I was actually offered a job. I was living in the city. I was offered a job about an hour and a half out of the city. And I wasn't going to move there as a principal. And it was like, Hey, you can be principal right now, but it's a job 90 minutes. Out. It's in the school district. It's 90 minutes outside. Um, and it might be two or three years that you're there and we might move you to another place. No guarantees. Right. And I, I struck, I said, I actually said no. And the reason I said no, and I thought, okay, I'm saying no, and I'm never going to get a, another offer. Like that was that once I said, no, they'll never give me another opportunity. And I said, no, and this is going to sound horrible because I taught a spin class. <laughs> sounds weird. I taught a spin class in the morning before going to work mm -hmm. every day. And I knew I wouldn't be able to do that. And it wasn't, I need to teach a spin class. It was for like money or anything like that. I need to teach this spin class in the morning for my mental health. It is actually a really good mm -hmm. thing. And if I'm spending like three and a half, hours a day on the road, I won't be good to that community. I won't be good to myself and I'm not moving there. So I said no. And then I gave the reason why, like, cause I just, there's mm -hmm. things I moved here for my life and they appreciated my honesty. And then three months later, I got a job in a place I really wanted to be. So that was actually, um, That's amazing. A, that was a really important thing for me. Cause I think a lot of times we don't pay attention to the social aspect, you know, that does tie yeah, teaching because we so are true. human beings, we are human beings. Um, I do want to, the, the admin thing is really important and, uh, it actually kind of ties back to, um, the Eric Thomas thing about ownership and, and some of the stuff that you, you shared as well. I remember working with the principal and they said, you know, my teachers, my teachers aren't like getting any of this and they're really struggling and blah, blah, blah. And I remember stopping them saying, maybe it's you <laughs> like, you know, like <laughs> you're like, you can blame your teachers all you want but your job is to lead. So if they're not moving forward, you have to question your own leadership. And so I'm not saying you're a bad mm -hmm. leader, but you saying the things that you say now just louder is not working. So you got to rethink your direction. It's so true. So I yeah. want to, I want to ask you this question. So I, like, I'm, I'm assuming this is mostly written, um, for teachers, but I, I guarantee administrators would benefit from this. And yes. if I'm an administrator, how would this book help me? So I actually, um, I throughout the time, I share a little bit of my own journey of just moving from mm. teaching into school administration and how that happened. So hopefully some connecting points there. But, but then at the end in my like tying it all together and recapping all four themes of uh, higher calling community, the only option and contextual joy, I speak to action steps or like clear takeaways for teachers and then for school administrators in each section. And so I say, how, how does higher calling apply to a teacher? And I give some takeaways and some recap moments and some reflection. And then I say for a school administrator and an entire, and then in addition to that, an entire section of the book, an entire part of it is written kind of like a journal. I don't like saying that completely because it's not the whole book. I don't want to make it like it's a journal book but there's an entire part of it that pauses from reading like a nonfiction book. And it actually is just questions and then blanks for answers where you could either write them in or you could type them 
And the idea is spurring conversation amongst school administrators, amongst teachers, and it's truly in re reflective in nature. And it's actually the same questions that I asked hmm. the teachers in the original study to be able to get what I, uh, the content that I ultimately got for this book. And so I'm giving them the chance to, now that you've read the four themes and now that you've read and I change the questions um, or I expand upon them in such a way that it's still relevant for a school administrator. And so where I might say to a teacher, you know, why did you first get into teaching? I, I expand it and say, um, now also as a school administrator, what made you make the switch from teaching to school administration? Why did you ultimately want to influence, um, you know, policy or culture or anything like that? So I do expansion questions for people who aren't officially in the classroom, but are still supporting people who are in the classroom. I love it. You know, I, I was like, I'm, as I'm listening to you and um, thinking about this, I think this book is very, well, it's obviously very timely. <laughs> And hopefully it gets there in I time. So. Hopefully it gets in there in time because like we might not have anyone left very soon. So uh, <laughs> I, I I just want to say, um, Jen, thanks for taking your time. I know Nolly, are you speaking? Um, and and actually, assistant principal, athletic director, and now have this new book. And so there's a lot of things, and for you to take time uh, really says something. I know you're really passionate about this. So um, everyone who's listening, if you can check out the book, Teacher Variance, check out Jen uh, on her social media. That's all linked down below. But Jen, congratulations. Uh, you know, it's a huge deal Thank to, you. to write a book. And uh, I'm sure the Mason people are pretty proud of you. So um, I hope it does really well. I hope people really enjoy it. But thanks for taking the time to share a little bit about what you shared yes. in the book. Well, I appreciate their support, but also your support. And I'm just super grateful. I like to say in front of people, because I hope you know the kind of impact you have to educators everywhere. So just thank you for the opportunity to be uh, on here with you, but also thanks for the work you do throughout the year to support all of us um, doing the work every day. So I really appreciate you. All right. Say hi everyone in Mason for me. And uh, I thank you everyone for listening. Have Will a do. wonderful day. Bye-bye.